Hello, everyone, and welcome back. In the previous two videos, we introduced the Riemann integral from Riemann sums, and we saw that it all comes from a very complex definition that involves both the partition and evaluation points. Now, we saw that we can only say that a Riemann integral exists if we have these certain uh, convergence results for all possible partitions with small enough mesh, so that's a small enough refinement or discretization of your interval, and for any evaluation point. Now, that is a very complex definition to actually work with in practice, as we've seen from some of the proofs in the previous lectures. And what we're going to do in this lecture is introduce another way of showing that a function is Riemann integrable. And this is named after a French mathematician, Gaston Darbeau. And what it's going to give us is a method of moving away from using evaluation points. So we're never going to get away from having a partition. Of course, we need to discretize that space, and we need to be able to do it arbitrarily. But what the Darbeau integrability condition allows us to do is say that it doesn't matter what the evaluation points are. We can actually take them to be this thing, which I'm going to show you in this lecture, and therefore we don't have to always worry about evaluation points. Now, of course, as we always like to start with, we're going to start with some uh, definitions here in order for me to better communicate to you what it is that I am trying to talk about here in terms of the Darbo integrability condition. So let's start with a nice definition here. We say, let f be a bounded function. So we need this thing to be bounded. And of course, you know, when we're talking about Riemann integrable functions, we already proved that they must be bounded anyways. So we're in familiar territory. Uh, be a bounded function on the interval a, b. And let p be any partition doesn't have to be big or small, doesn't matter. And then let's let capital MI equal to the supremum of F of X. Now notice I didn't put an absolute value around this. I'm asking what is the biggest value that this thing can take on, positive or negative, such that X belongs to the ith subinterval of your mesh. And little mi to be the infimum of this function on each one of your sub intervals. Okay, so what you do is you take a partition and you look at each one of the little sub intervals and you ask yourself what is the biggest and smallest values that my function f can take on. Now, of course, biggest and smallest here is written in terms of the sup and inf, because we are assuming that this is a continuous function. There's no assumption that we actually take on those biggest and smallest values. But it is bounded, so therefore the sup and the inf actually exist. Remember, we proved this for sequences, and these are properties of real numbers. So note, of course, that mi and capital mi are real numbers themselves. And we're going to define the upper sum. And this is going to be, uh, we'll also define the lower sum and the lower sum by u of f comma p, so u for upper, f is the function you're interested in, p is the partition. This is going to be the Riemann sum where you are going to take the value or the height of your rectangles to be that capital M maximum on each sub interval. And you're going to have the lower sum to be as you can probably guess, the same idea, but the height of your rectangles now is going to be the little m value, your infimum. Okay, so observe, so this is just a remark, of course, since the max is bigger than the, the min or the soup is bigger than the inf, 
by definition, your lower sum is smaller than your actual Riemann sum for the same partition in arbitrary evaluation points. And that thing is smaller than your upper sum. And this, again, you can just write down the definition of your Riemann sum to see this, right? You're taking the, the height of these rectangles on the left case, the lower sum, to be as small as they could possibly be. You're taking in the rightmost case as big as they could possibly be. And then the Riemann sum itself is just everything in between that, anything or everything between it. Okay, we can actually say a lot more. Uh, let's start with a little lemma here. And let's say that if P and P prime are two partitions, of A to B, so it doesn't matter what they are, then we can always say that the lower sum is smaller than the upper sum. So this is actually quite interesting, right? Because this is saying, in, in my little observe at the top of this, it says that if it's the same partition, of course these things are ordered. The lower sum is smaller than the upper sum. But what this is telling you is that actually, you know, I can use two different partitions and the upper sum is always going to be bigger than no matter what you get for the lower sum. Okay, so how do we prove this? Well, the proof is sort of inductive in nature. So it's kind of cool. It's maybe a new method of proof that you haven't seen before. So let's start with, so start with the case when P and P prime differ by a single point. Okay, so that's what we're gonna start with because we know if P and P prime are exactly the same, then we already have this by my observation. So we're gonna start by asking ourselves, okay, what if they only differ by a single point? There's just one point that's different in them. We're gonna say, let P be as we normally would, x0 to xn, and let some z be an element between or in one of the subintervals. Of course, if they're going to differ by a single point, in i case, z is going to be the point they differ by. And so it's in the interval a to b, it's definitely in one of the subintervals. So for one specific index, um, I, you have this, and let's let P prime equal to the original partition P with Z added. Now, this looks a lot like what I did in the end of last lecture when we were showing that the Riemann uh, integral of a function over a whole, whole interval, so A to C, can be broken up in the middle at B. So the same type of idea where I look at a uh, mesh where I just add one more point. And again, all this is doing is taking that ith sub interval from xi minus one to xi and breaking it up, putting your a little way station in the middle, a little z in there. Okay, now let's start with some definitions. Let mi prime, mi uh, plus one prime, capital mi prime, and mi plus one prime denote the inf and sup. So I'm gonna write this in words. I could write these in mathematics, but it's just a little easier to put this in words for now. Of f uh, for the sub intervals. And this is going to be xi minus one to z and z to xi. Okay. So all I'm doing is I broke up the interval. I put a z in the middle of one of those intervals. And so then I just asked, what is the inf in the soup on each of those sub intervals? Now, clearly, since I've broken up these intervals, mi prime is bigger than or equal to mi. And mi plus one prime is bigger than or equal to 
mi, where mi is the infimum over the whole interval xi minus one to xi. That's just coming from my original definition that I gave you at the beginning of this lecture. Similarly, I can get that mi capital mi prime is less than or equal to capital mi and mi plus one prime is less than or equal to mi prime. Okay, so again, this is just coming from the fact that you broke up the interval. So you're looking at the max over the entire thing and then the max over uh, the two smaller constituent components. So what does this tell me? Well, this tells me that the component of the Riemann sum that comes from this i piece here, mi delta xi, well, by definition, this is less than or equal to mi, and then let's break this up, z, or let's, this is equal still, because I'm going to add and subtract the z component into, into this. mi xi minus z. So I broke it up. I put a z in the middle of this thing that's still equal. I add and subtracted the same thing. Delta xi is just xi minus xi minus one. Then I use that inequality with the primes. So I get mi prime z minus xi minus one plus mi plus one prime xi minus z which by definition, these minimums are smaller than the maximums. So I can, I can say this is less or equal with the capital M's here now. So nothing really fancy going on. All I did was broke up the interval. And these things are less than the, the capital M without the prime now. So sort of undoing what I did for the, uh, the little m's, sort of going in a circle almost. And this is equal to mi delta xi, okay? So I have this long chain here. But again, since the partitions only differ at a single point, that single point is z, this gives me the following. I get this chain that comes out of this. Now, the left or the top part here is the lower sum for my partition P, because the only thing that's gonna be different here is at the index I. And this is going to be less than or equal to the lower sum with P prime. That's what this inequality is giving me. So I'll put a little star underneath it just so you can see where it comes from. But then of course, from my observation, I know that this is true. And if we'd like to see where that comes from in here, that's this piece right here. And then similarly, we get the upper sum of F and P, which comes from this inequality right here. And so this shows us that we actually get the inequality from the lemma when we have only one difference between these meshes. So this proves the lemma. For P and P prime differing by only one point. Now, of course, we want to do this for arbitrary points. So if these things uh, differ by, um, say, finitely many points, we can extend this argument. So moreover, if P and P prime um, differ, or sorry, let's, uh, let's say it like this. Moreover, if P prime is formed by adding finitely many points, so not just one anymore, um, but maybe three or seven or 15 points to P, we can repeat the argument 
the argument above, right? Because now we're just focusing on the, the above inequality here for the finitely many points that were added. So it's gonna give us the same thing. We can repeat the argument above to again prove the lemma. Okay, but if you see what we're doing here, we're always assuming P is smaller than P prime, right? Because P prime is, is formed by adding points to P. Okay, now let's suppose P and P prime are arbitrary. So suppose P and P prime are arbitrary. One doesn't have, P prime doesn't have to be bigger than P anymore. Our arbitrary partitions uh, of that interval AB. Of AB. Well, then let's let P double prime equal to the union of both of these. So it's the biggest partition, right? It includes all of the partition elements from P and all of the partition elements from P prime. And so from above, right? Each one of these partitions is finite. So that means that P double prime is adding finitely many points to P. It's also adding finitely many points to P prime. And so from above, we have, Okay, well, the lower sum with P must be less than or equal to the lower sum with P double prime because P double prime is formed by adding finitely many points to, uh, to the partition P, which from our observation is smaller than the upper sum just by definition. But since P double prime is also adding finitely many points to P prime, we get this, this. And so if I just underline what's important here, the last or the first and the last here, which prove the lemma. And so there's our proof. So the upper sums always stay above the lower sums, right? That's what that lemma is telling us. So it's a weird proof, right? Uh, we sort of ask ourselves, what happens if they differ by one point? We sort of examine that. And then, you know, what happens if they differ by finitely many points? And then we use this, what's called a mutual refinement. That's what this union here is, that P double prime. And it is like a sort of super mesh. It involves all of the mesh points from P and all of the mesh points from P prime. Okay, now in order to, to provide Darbo's um, integrability condition, we need another definition here. So we have a definition of upper and lower sums. Now let's ask ourselves, what is an upper and lower integral? So similar how we went from Riemann sum to Riemann integral, we're gonna go from upper and lower sums to upper and lower integrals. So let's define the upper integral and lower integral. So we put them in red, they're definitions, it's important. And this is of a function f on a b by, now our notation, sorry, our notation here is going to be the integral from a to b of f. We're not gonna put the dx in here, this is just notation. And we put the bar over top for the upper interval, integral, okay? So upper bar up top. And this is the infimum of all upper sums. P is a partition of AB. Okay, so this is a very, very abstract thing to do, right? It says, what is the smallest upper sum you can get over all possible uh, partitions, right? So this is something you can't exhaust, right? You wouldn't be able to do this on pencil and paper. Uh, but as we'll see later on in the, in the following video, we'll see sort of what the utility of using these things are. And in particular, the next result is gonna be Darbo's integrability condition, 
which is going to sort of slightly ease us into understanding Riemann integrable functions. Now, similarly, the lower sum, as you can imagine, you have a bar down below, and this is the largest or the supremum of all lower sums. Okay. Now, from the previous lemma, so we should put a little note here, the lower sum is always less than or equal to the upper sum. That is always true. And that comes from the fact that the upper sums are always bigger than the lower sums, right? So if you take the, the smallest possible upper sum and the biggest possible lower sum, it's still going to be, um, you're still going to preserve that inequality from the previous lemma that we just proved. Okay, so maybe you're thinking to yourself, uh, you know, this looks a little ugly. This is kind of a, a hairy definition, uh, but let me give you the Darbo integrability condition that allows you to move away from using evaluation points and move into using these upper and lower integrals. So this is the main theorem of the lecture. This is the Darbo integrability condition. And in the next lecture after this, we'll see how to use this and how it can be helpful for us. So let's let F be bounded on AB. Okay, then F is Riemann integrable. So we're assuming it's bounded right off the bat. It's Riemann integrable if and only if now you might be wondering right off the bat, why is this thing have to be bounded? Of course it has to be bounded so we can define the lower and upper integrals. So this thing is going to be Riemann integral if and only if the limit as the mesh goes to zero. Now you know what this means. This is in terms of epsilons and deltas of the upper sum minus the lower sum is equal to zero. So if the upper sum and the lower sum are going into the same value as the mesh gets finer and finer and finer, then you know that this thing is Riemann integrable. And when this condition, so when this condition is satisfied, then the actual Riemann integral is equal to the upper and lower sums. So one of the nice things about the Darbo integrability condition is it allows us to rule out functions that are not uh, integrable, right? And for example, this is how we showed that that function that takes one on the rational numbers and zero on the irrational numbers we essentially showed that the upper and lower sums are different, right? Because the minimum was zero, the maximum was one, and therefore the upper and lower sums couldn't converge. So we kind of already did this behind the scenes. Now we can see that this is actually part of Darbo's integrability condition. Okay, so the proof of this is going to be fairly involved. Let's start on a whole fresh new piece of paper and this is an if and only if statement. So what we're going to do is we are going to first assume the right component. So that's the limit uh, going to zero. And we're gonna show that the function itself has to be Riemann integrable. Then after we prove that, we'll start by saying the function is Riemann integrable. Now let me show you that the upper and lower sums converge together. So start by assuming, so I'm going to write this as this means we're proving the right to left implication for the if and only if statement. Let's suppose that the limit as the mesh goes to zero of the upper sum minus the lower sum of this partition 
is equal to zero. Okay, so that's what we're going to assume. Now, what do we know here? So we want to show that the function is Riemann integrable. Well, now we know that the lower sums here, since the lower integral is taking a supremum over all lower sums, then I get that this has to be the case, right? Because I'm taking a supremum. It's the biggest possible of all of these things. It's a least upper bound. Similarly, we already know that the upper and lower sums are ordered in this way. The, the lower integral is smaller than or equal to the upper integral. And by the same argument, the upper sums sit above the upper integral. And this happens for all partitions P. Okay. So then, sorry, then what we can say here is that zero is less than or equal to the difference from the upper sum minus the lower sum, right? So that just comes from the fact that the upper sum is always above you, which from this chain of inequalities is less than or equal to the difference between the upper and lower sums. So the difference between the upper and lower integrals is bounded above by the difference between the upper and lower sums, which we've already seen goes to zero as the mesh goes to zero, right? That's what we assumed. We said, suppose that this limit is equal to zero. That's what this is saying. So hence, you're getting zero is less than or equal to this difference of upper and lower integrals, which is less than or equal to zero. This tells us, so hence, the upper sum is equal to the lower sum. This, which we denote by capital L. Okay, so I'm going to use L because we know that this is going to be the limit. It's going to be the value of my Riemann sum. But then, so then, if epsilon is greater than zero, we know that there exists a delta greater than zero such that uh, for all partition P, Uh, such that the mesh is less than delta, uh, we must have, well, what is it that we must have? We must have both L and the Riemann sum between the lower sum and the upper sum. Now, the Riemann sum being squeezed in there just comes from the, the, our original observation, right? This is just from the definition. So we talked about this at the very beginning of the lecture. Now also the value of these, uh, the, these upper and lower integrals, which we said are equal and equal to L, well, they are between the lower and upper sums just from this inequality at the top of the board, which I'll mark with a red star. Now, we also know this and the difference between these two things is less than epsilon. Why? Well, that we know that they're converging to zero. So that's all this is, right? So the reason that there exists a delta for this is coming from our assumption that this limit goes to zero. But then this tells us that since L and P are wedged into this interval that is less than epsilon, this tells us also that my Riemann sum has to be within epsilon of that L. But this implies 
that F is Riemann integrable because we now know that the Riemann sum for any small partition is within, um, within epsilon of this limit L and this integral from A to B of F of X dx is equal to L, right? So it just comes from the fact that the upper and lower sums can be really, really, really pushed together. And you have that the Riemann sum uh, and the limit L are stuck in between those two things for a very, very small mesh. And so therefore um, we can see that those things are within epsilon as well. So you're just using the upper and lower sums to come down on each other or sort of squeeze everything in. So that gives us the implication from right to left. Now let's do the implication from left to right. Let's start with a nice new fresh sheet of paper. The implication from left to right is we are going to assume that we have a Riemann integrable function. So assume F is Riemann integrable and set, you know, by the definition of this thing being Riemann integrable, that means that this Riemann integral exists. So let's call this thing L just as a nice shorthand. Okay, so then let's let epsilon be greater than zero. Again, we want to show that this limit of the upper sum minus the lower sum is going to zero. Okay, let epsilon be bigger than zero. Then we know there exists a delta such that if the mesh is smaller than delta, this implies, well, what will this imply? This implies that the Riemann sum minus L is less than epsilon over four. Now you can see that I threw an epsilon over four into this thing. That means that it's going to be three triangle inequalities that are gonna come up. You'll see how this sort of fits together as we go through, right? But I want you to be cognizant of that and to really notice you know, what the steps are that we're taking along this proof. The other piece of this is this is independent of the choice of the choice of evaluation points. So of the XI bars. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna choose the evaluation points so that we can get the upper and lower sums in order to converge as the mesh goes to zero. So how are we gonna do that? We're gonna denote, of course, we just denote the mesh, which is, x0, x1, x2, all the way up to xn, which is of course equal to b. And we're gonna select, so I'm going to choose evaluation points. Remember the Darbo integrability condition poses things in terms of upper and lower sums, which are independent, or they, it means they don't use the evaluation points. So I'm gonna choose some evaluation points because I know this is gonna work for all of them. And select, the xi bars in each one of these sub intervals uh, so that, well, my supremum on, my, on each interval, so that's capital MI from the definition, minus epsilon over four times B minus A. So this is a positive number, B is bigger than A. It's, we're of course using a non-trivial interval. So this thing has a length. This is less than or equal to, uh, sorry, it's less than, pardon me, less than f of x i bar, which is less than or equal to m i. So that means that I can get extremely close to the supremum, right? That's the definition of the supremum. It means that if you have uh, this piece here, if I, that thing, I thought it was a lower bound from the definition of supremum, it means I can get a point in my space that will put me above it in terms of the function. And this is going to be for all i. Now, what does this tell me? By that choice of evaluation points, I get that my upper sum minus my Riemann sum. Well, let's take a look at this. This is the sum from i equal to one to n of mi, that's the height of the rectangles using the upper sum, minus f of xi bar, 
which is the height of the rectangles using the Riemann sum times delta xi. Well, this difference right here is less than, so this is less than for each i value here, epsilon over four times b minus a, and then all multiplied by delta xi. Right, so the, the distance between the capital MI and your F at your evaluation points is no more than epsilon over four times B minus A. Now we've seen this trick before. Now this is a constant function that you're taking a Riemann sum of. The sum of delta XI's is equal to B minus A. So this thing is equal to epsilon over four. So there's my epsilon over four again. Similarly, we can find evaluation points, points, let's call them xi prime bar, such that, well, zero is less than or equal to your Riemann sum using these evaluation points minus the lower sum which is less than epsilon over four. So it's the same argument. It's coming from the fact that you're using an infimum, so you can get very, very close to it. In particular, you can get within epsilon over four times B minus A of it. And putting this all together, this all together gives, well, okay. Remember, we wanted to show that the upper sum minus the lower sum, this thing goes to zero as the mesh goes to zero. So in fact, you know, we know what a limit means. We need this thing to be less than epsilon. Well, this is gonna be less than or equal to, we can add and subtract in our Riemann sum. And our Riemann sum in this case with the, uh, evaluation points x i bar. And then since we added it in, it subtracted it off. And this is going to be minus L. So you're going to see this is a, an, a, uh, a triangle inequality done four times by adding and subtracting a bunch of different terms. So you can see I added and subtracted in L, which is the limit, which is the value of the Riemann integral. And this is minus P of F of Xi bar prime. Those are the evaluation points that make the lower sum smaller than epsilon over four. And again, F of Xi prime bar minus the lower sum of F to P. So what you can see is that I added and subtracted in the Riemann sum with the first evaluation points, the Riemann sum with the second, the prime evaluation points, and the value of the integral. Then I applied the triangle inequality uh, three times here. So I did it all in one step just to make it pretty. But now I know that the first piece, the upper sum is within epsilon over four of that Riemann sum. We proved that on the previous page right here. In the, in the middle. Then we know by definition of the Riemann sum converging to the Riemann integral that regardless of the evaluation points, this thing is within epsilon over four of its limit. That holds for this, the third piece of this sum as well. It's just different evaluation points, but we remember from the definition, it's independent of the evaluation points. And then finally, the last epsilon over four comes from the last term from the fact that the choice of those, uh, those prime evaluation points put us within epsilon over four of the lower sum, which gives us epsilon, which therefore, which implies that the limit as the mesh goes to zero of the upper sum minus the lower sum is equal to zero as desired. And that gives us the proof of Darbo's integrability condition. Now, when we come back in the next lecture, we're going to actually use this condition to characterize 
Riemann integrable functions and ask ourselves, which functions do we know for sure are Riemann integrable? Now, something that you probably are already familiar with is the idea that continuous functions are Riemann integrable. That's what we're going to prove in the uh, next lecture. And we're going to do it using the Darbo integrability condition. Now you should understand that this condition that Darbo gave us is an equivalent way of characterizing whether or not a function is going to be Riemann integrable. The advent of using it is that it doesn't use evaluation points. The downside is that it's kind of complicated, right? It uses these upper and lower integrals or these upper and lower sums that require you to take infimums and supremums, something that is not always practical. It's not always that easy. But we'll see from a theoretical mathematics perspective that it can be very advantageous to us because it can ease up our proofs that we're going to see in the next lecture and some of the ones that follow.